Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I'm here today to tell you about natural reactors. They cut the sound off on my Geiger counter. Okay. Alright, I'd like to talk to you about a reactor that existed in a place called, or a place that is called, uh, Gabum. It's in the west coast of Africa. There's a place called the Oklo Uranium Mine, which apparently uh, about two billion years ago, give or take a couple million years, hosted the world's only, at least to my knowledge, uh, natural nuclear reactor. Basically what, what I mean by natural nuclear reactor is I mean that uranium that was underground underwent nuclear fission without any people around, and it just did it. Now, how did it do it? Well, that's physics and science. I can explain. Um, it's kind of neat that it did. It was discovered in the 1970s. Some uh, people were actually checking uranium that they'd gotten from the mine. They wanted to see, you know, how much uranium-235 it had in it. And I'll explain in a minute. Uranium-235 is very, very, very important. And they discovered that there wasn't enough. It wasn't nearly enough. Way less than there should be. Well, not really way less. Only a little bit less. But the point is, it's, it, it's very unusual to find it at the rates that they did. And they did a little research and figured out what it was. Apparently this had been previously predicted as well, but um, this uranium had undergone nuclear fission. And without anyone around, it just did it. Because it could. Anyhow, there's a little bit more to it than that, but let me explain. Basically, uranium is a wonderfully interesting material. Strange, strange, strange metal. It, under, it can go undergo nuclear fission, meaning it can split apart into lesser things, krypton and barium, those sorts of things. It can split from one big atom into two or more smaller atoms. Uranium-235 can do this more readily than any of the other uraniums. Uranium-234, uranium-238. Uranium-238, by the way, is the majority of it. If this big block of, some, of uh, concrete here, if this were all natural uranium, God, if it were, I wouldn't be this close to it. But if it were, then how much? Maybe a marble this big of it would be uranium-235, maybe even a little bit less than this. And uranium-234 would be like a granule of sand. Anyway, uranium-235 is capable of catching a neutron, meaning a neutron flying through the air, one of those little tiny particles called a neutron, smack, smacked right into it. It does not actually split it. That's a common misconception. It doesn't actually split it. What happens is the neutron comes over and, and, it, and it smacks right into the, the atom, and the atom accepts it. It gets close enough that it's able to bond to the atom via a force called the strong nuclear force. So a thunk sticks right into the atom and holds it. The problem is because of the complexities of how atoms stay together, that's just one too much. You ever been holding too much stuff in your hands? And in fact, this analogy works great. You're holding a bunch of stuff in your hands, about as much stuff as you can carry. You're walking upstairs with it, you know, you're trying to go somewhere. And then somebody puts one more thing in your hands. You don't usually drop it immediately. Here's what happens. That one last thing they put in your hands, you start wiggling and stuff starts going left and right. And you're, you're losing control of it. And, oh, there it goes. And it all goes everywhere. Sometimes you hold a little bit of it and the rest of it falls. Sometimes it all falls. It works like that. When the atom collects that neutron, sure, it'll take that extra neutron. Why not? But it's just one too many. The atom goes into a metastable state. It doesn't split apart at this point. It's still an atom, but it's wobbling all over the place and oscillating like crazy. And then all of a sudden, thunk, it's just too much and it splits apart. And it produces a few more neutrons in the process. And in a chain reaction, those neutrons will fly off and hit other neutrons. Those neutrons that go flying out immediately are called prompt neutrons. They go and shoot straight out immediately and they set off other nuclear reactions. Those are the ones you're looking for in a nuclear fission. You can get other neutrons afterwards that are called um, uh, delayed neutrons. Delayed neutrons are when one of those pieces that pops off will then after a short time spit out another neutron itself and those are not as important because by the time they come out everything's all, the party's all, already over with so those aren't very important. But um, Basically, uranium-235 can, can, can capture a slow neutron, a thermal neutron, and this S-capture, as it's called, occurs uh, uh, 
sometimes automatically as a result of neutrons flying through the air and you get spontaneous fission and sometimes it happens when it's man-made during like a nuclear bomb or a nuclear reactor or something like that. So the point of the matter is the more 235 you get, the more go juice you get. So scientists are always, always preoccupied with trying to get the, the ratio of uranium-235 to U-238 to be a little bit higher. They don't want 1% or even 0.17%. In nature, it's like 0 0.1, 0 0.7, something like that. It's really, really tiny. It's less than 1%. They want 2%, 3%, 4%, somewhere in there if they can get it for a normal reactor. So your reactor down the street, the one that you unfortunately live nearby, it's probably burning around 4%. I shouldn't call it burning because it's not burning, but you get the point. Around 4%. Nuclear bombs are usually 80% or better. So that's weapons grade. And the reason you want more of that, for uh, first off, is more of it can split, and second off, then you get more of those prompt neutrons you want too, which are very, very, very important. Anyhow, Oklo, in Gabon, which is in uh, Western Africa, underneath the little pointy part, and um, basically put, they had these huge deposits of uranium underground, and they went into f uh, fission, and they pulsed in and out of fission for pff, at least 100,000 years, maybe a little bit more, and they did this about almost 2 billion years ago, something like, uh, one, I think it was 1.7, 1.8 billion years ago. That's, a, that's really quite impressive. Before I explain how they did it, let me just remind you of the natural radioactivity in rocks. Remember, under the ground there's lots of radiation in rocks and stuff, and uranium, of course, is a great source of this. Let me put this little guy up here where you can see it. It's more fun to talk about uranium, uh, uranium and radiation and stuff when you, when you have something that ticks. Let me cut it on. Some rocks do not have any particular amount of radiation in them. Like this little guy, I'm just getting background radiation. This little ticks you're hearing, that's just stuff coming from space, not much. Things like granite have a little bit. This one has nice crystals all the way through it. You probably can't see them from the camera, but beautiful hornblende crystals all the way through it. This piece of granite right here, plenty of ticking. I haven't figured out what's in it yet, but whatever it is, it ticks a little. And of course, this little guy right here, which I really like because when you put your Geiger counter over it, you get a lot. Move it to a position where it's not going to... there. Fun at parties, trust me. Nothing says fun like irradiation. Anyway, you cut the sound off. And let's move this down so it's out of the way a little bit. Alright, basically put, rocks like this one existed in Gabon, and uh, they still do, and they contain uranium-238 and uranium-235 and uranium-234 natural radi uh, uh, uranium. Anyhow, um, this natural uranium cannot just undergo nuclear fission. First off, you need to have a certain amount of it. You need to have at least 2%. That's like cutting it. You really need more like 3 or 4. But 3 is generally about the magic number. Well, scientists were baffled because they said, wait a minute, there's not even one percent. How could... oh wait, that's right. Two billion years ago, there was three percent. Actually, a little bit more than three percent. If you do the math, and I'm going to be doing my Geiger Counters 101 series, I think it's what, part four, part five, something like that, um, I'm going to be talking about the math of uh, 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 nuclear physics, just the basic math. Because it's a Geiger Counters 101, so I'm not going to get into the, you know, contour intervals and stuff. Well, you would do a contour interval for this anyway, but I'm going to get into really basic stuff, like how to calculate half-lives and how to inversely calculate half-lives. 
And you can check BioNerd, she has a lot of good stuff on do, doing that as well too. But basically put, um, two billion years ago there was 3% or more uh, uranium-235 in, in every chunk of uranium, of uh, natural uranium. That's enough for nuclear fission. Second off, you need a lot of it. If you have just a little tiny bit, you have what's called a subcritical mass. Subcritical masses are not enough to, 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 to engage in criticality without external help. Criticality means that there's an, enough of the material there that there, there's a probability, a pretty high probability, that when a neutron goes through, it's going to get captured by an atom and split apart. That's sort of what it means. So criticality in this case is very important. This here, for example, if it were, if it were natural uranium, would be subcritical. It's, it's just not enough. Even if it were, were uranium-235, it's still subcritical. There's ju just not enough. If I bombarded it with a neutron beam, it would go into fission, and there'd be fission and heat and all kinds of stuff coming out everywhere. But the second I took away the neutron beam, this would stop glowing and it would go back to normal again. A critical mass is when you have a larger chunk, like about a baseball, softball size. That's a critical mass. That's the uh, epic critical mass people always talk about. And when you have a critical mass, it is the right size that when a neutron goes through it, it has a relatively high probability of striking an atom, being captured by the atom, the atom becomes metastable, breaks apart, and then you get the daughter products and a lot of energy that comes from them. The biggest thing you can get though is called a supercritical mass. That's the big one. A lot of people mistake the supercritical and the critical. Critical masses don't explode. They can explode. You pack them full of C4, hit the button, yeah, sure, you get a boom. But a, a super critical mass is a mass that is so large, like if you get a giant chunk of 235 like this, that it will just go undergo, undergo fission by itself. That's dangerous. You do not want a super critical mass ever because you, you can't control it. Subcritical, if you cut off the neutron beam or whatever you're using for neutrons, it will calm down. Critical, you can still moderate it to some degree, you can slow it down, stop it, and whatever, maybe, maybe. Super, it's, it's all gone. Well, in Oklo, you had large chunks of uranium-238, uh, not 238, but natural uranium, mostly 238, 3%, 235, a trace here and there, 234, and they were uh, uh, probably critical at this point. Little parts of them were critical, wherever the material was really, really, really thickly together. And so you had almost what you need. You had enough material, enough fuel, and a high enough enrichment. The last thing you need is you need to slow down those neutrons. Because the neutrons that come out of uranium fission are too fast. And if they're too fast, then they won't get captured. They'll just deflect right off the atom and shoot right by and, and, and so on. If you throw a softball, if you throw a baseball at somebody that's too fast, they can't catch it. If I shoot you with a bullet, it goes into you and kills you. But if I chuck a bullet, just throw a bullet, you can catch it with your hands. So it has to be slow, or else it just goes right through, or right by, or whatnot. Well, it doesn't go through, it goes by, but whatever. Um, to do this, you need a moderator. Uh, nuclear reactors have used moderators for years, like Chernobyl, I think, used graphite. Oh, God. In fact, several major nuclear disasters have used graphite. Are we getting the hint yet here? Like wind scale in the 1950s where the reactor caught on fire, yet nobody knows about that for some reason. I don't understand what's up with that. Uh, graphite works fine, but water works great. You ever heard of light water reactors, heavy water reactors? Well, that's how they work. They take water, and as the neutrons flying through it, pings off the water. I mean, that's not really completely accurate, but it bing, 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 bing. It pings off the water and slows down. This is a lot of energy. It has recoils and stuff. And as it's losing all this energy, it slows down until it's the right speed to be captured by the uranium-238. Or, sorry, 235. And as a result of this, if you have a large chunk of 235, and then you pour enough water over it, you can actually cause it to go into nuclear fission. Remove the water, and it will slow back down again. That is called a water-moderated nuclear reactor. That's what happened at Oklo. The, the water rushed across the mineral deposits and caused the moderation of the neutrons, turning them from fast neutrons to thermal neutrons, which are slow neutrons. This is what happened. And then you had the criticality that, that occurred inside of the um, uh, uh, 
uh, material and then you had nuclear fission. Now they know what happened because of the trace products that are released afterwards, they're all over the place. Most of them are gone in two billion years. Cesium-137, strontium-90, oh my god, those are, those are gone a long time ago. They, they've gone through many, 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 many zillions of generations of their half-life, they're gone. There might be some microscopic traces of them here and there, but that, that's the best that you're going to get. The biggest telltale sign is the uranium-235 concentration is so much smaller than it should be. Additionally, neutrons that were produced from the uranium-235 bombardment actually created things like plutonium. Yes, pl real plutonium was created. Large quantities of plutonium. Plutonium is not truly a man-made only substance. It's usually man-made, but it can be naturally occurring. In this case, it was naturally occurring. The plutonium itself is probably all gone by now, too, or the majority of it is. There's little traces of it, it might still be there. But um, many tons of it were created at the time. But the, the, the decay products that come from plutonium are still there. Some of them. So, the whole damn thing wasn't very much power. It would have been enough power to run, who knows, maybe a couple houses or something like that for a lot, for 100,000 years. And what happened is the heat from it would, would heat up the water and boil the water away, and then it wouldn't be able to moderate the neutrons, and it would cool down and cut off again, and then the water would come back, and it would moderate the neutrons, and it would heat back up again and burn the water away. And this went in cycles like this. Isn't that just amazing? And I'd like to point out that in all of this time, Oklo, in 100,000 years of, of running without a single human being, never melted down. So nature has a better nuclear record, safety record anyway, than human beings do. Pretty sad, isn't it? But anyhow, this has been Tom from anti-proton.com, and I urge you to look up Oklo. I'll put some links in so you can take a peek at it. It's really amazing. Really, 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 really neat. It shows the age of the Earth. Um, it shows a lot of information about, well, it gives you a lot of information about how nuclear reactions work and what is required to make them work. So, enjoy. Alright, so here we are with the crystal, and as you can see with this magnifying glass, maybe uh, those are horn blend crystals. See them? Yeah, it's not really helping too much. Horn blend crystals. Beautiful horn blend crystals. I found this at a um, landscaping shop. You just buy this and throw it in your yard. Look at these beautiful little crystals all the way through this rock. Really nice. Really, really nice.